We looked this morning in our scripture reading at 1 Samuel uh, chapter 21 and chapter 22. 1 Samuel chapter 1 or chapter 21 beginning with verse 10. And it says, David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see this man is mad. Why have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all of his families heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. And David went from there to Mizpah of Moab. And he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and my mother stay with you till I know what God will do for me. And they left there with the king of Moab. And they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. Then the prophet of Gad said to David, Do not remain in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. Are you ready for the message? All right, here's where we're going to start, okay? I need you to do this. I need you to look straight ahead, okay? This is not for me. This is for you, okay? I want you to look straight ahead. Don't look to the right. Don't look to the left. Straight ahead, okay? You ready? All right, here it is. Is there somebody in your life that's always late? Don't look around. Someone that you are always waiting for. They are chronically late all of the time. Just think about that person. Okay, now here's the thing. If you don't have that person in, in your life, everybody's thinking about you. <laughs> You're like, why is everyone always showing up so early and stuff like that? Listen, it is not enjoyable to wait. Nobody likes to wait. I will tell you that when I was younger, every once in a while I'd buy a new pair of shoes and I, I'd, my parents would give me a budget on what that cost of those shoes were and I'd go to the store and I'd pick out those shoes and I'd fall in love with those shoes and every single time I'd say, can I wear them home? And I would always wear them home. And I, I did that when I was younger. And by younger, I mean last Tuesday. I, I just don't like to necessarily wait. But, but very few people like to wait. We don't like waiting for the bus. I think there's an entirely different time capsule that exists while you're waiting for a school bus or a, or a city bus or something like that. It just takes so long. We, we don't like waiting for a vacation, 85 days for our family. Uh, we, we don't necessarily like waiting for a tax return. We don't like waiting for the waiter to come and to take our order. We don't necessarily like waiting for Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright to show up. Waiting is one of the least favorite things that we ever do. But what happens when the thing or the person that we're waiting for is God? Uh, what happens when that's the piece that we're waiting on? We can get frustrated with the bus for taking so long and the government takes so long. And we kind of don't have high expectations on the bus or the government. But, but God, why is it taking so long for God to do the things that we were promised? 
Now, there's an interesting thing that's unfolded in my study of 1 Samuel here uh, that I've noticed in my study of 1 Samuel lately is that, that two weeks ago, we talked about how God speaks to our past. Remember, God says to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? How long are you holding on to some stuff for the past? Last week, we talked about dealing with some stuff that's right in front of us right now in terms of the present. David had to face that Goliath, that large thing that was blocking his path in that moment. He had to deal with that right now question. And now that we move to this next section of David's life in 1 Samuel, we're dealing with the future. God has made a promise to David, but boy, is it taking a while. There are some things that he's been promised ahead and he's waiting to happen. But man, it's taking a while. So it's really fascinating that in this little segment of scripture, God has spoken about our past, our present, and this morning he's going to speak to us about our future. Did you notice here at the end of chapter 21 and chapter 22, dealing with where, where David is in this moment? David is on the run. In fact, he's running for his life. He's running for for his life because on two separate occasions, Saul has taken a spear that he happens to have with him at the dinner table. I don't know why he brings a a spear to the dinner table. It wouldn't have happened in my house growing up. I promise you that. But, But he takes the spear that he's got at the table and two different times he takes the spear and tries to pin David to the wall. Now, some of you can relate to that because you've been at some dinner tables where knives were flowing back and forth, but they, they were verbal knives. This is a real live spear that David has to duck in order to live. Because of this spirit, David now has to spend all of his days running away. He spends some time in the chapters that we didn't read today, but he spends some of that time hanging out with Samuel in a little small town. It tells us in the passage that we just read, he spent some of that time running to the king of Gath. Now, if you recognize the title Gath, the name Gath, that's because it's a Philistine city. Yeah, it's really familiar. That's Goliath's hometown. So David has to run and he has to hide in Goliath's hometown. That may not have been the best and easiest thing uh, for him to do. Part of the time... He has to pretend like he's crazy. He he has to, uh, we find himself in in chapter 22, he's now living inside of a cave. Now, how did that happen? How How did that happen to David's life? Well, here's what happened. He is anointed as king. Wasn't his idea. He didn't ask for that. He didn't run for that office. All of a sudden, that was done to him by God not his choice. He has served in King Saul's court and provided care for Saul in the court. He defeated the giant that nobody else wanted to defeat. He has served loyally and as a decorated soldier uh, in war. And now he's running for his life. He's having to beg for food. He's having to pretend like he's uh, crazy. He's having to find a safe place for him and for all of his family to hide. He's having to live in enemy territory. Because he's waiting for the promise of God. And there's a part of this that I'm sure that David's like, I don't know whether this is really worth waiting for. I don't know what God is planning on doing. I don't know what the delay here in this matter is. I don't don't know whether this is all worth it. Because waiting is one of the hardest things that we have to do. Nobody likes to wait. Is this going to be worth it? Is God going to fulfill his promise? I think this passage of Scripture reveals a handful of things for us today in terms of understanding what it means to be waiting for God. The first thing that I noticed in this passage of Scripture is that the work of God takes time. The work of God takes time. I want you to see as I kind of look this up a little bit, the amount of time between when David is anointed as king to when he's in this cave is 20 years. It's going to be another five years before David actually becomes king. Man, where were you 20 years ago? 
Imagine waiting on that promise that length of time. It takes a really, really long time. Why does it take God so long to do things? Well, it's actually not God. It's us. God does just fine in an instant and in a spoken word. In fact, he created the universe in six segments of stated words. Let there be light. Let there be the firmament. Let there be the seas that teem with with all of these animals. Let all of these things happen. God does things in an instant. He parts the Red Sea in an instant. Jesus walks through all of Israel and he heals in an instant. The delay... The length of time that it takes is not a God problem. It's an us situation. It is a matter that sometimes it takes a while for us to catch up, keep up, and hear up what he has to say. God is moving not at the pace that he moves, but God oftentimes moves at the pace for us to understand. One of the examples of this is going back to the... Israelites in Egypt and there's the the 10 plagues, the 10 signs that God unfolds. Why does that take so long? Part of that is because that's what's got to happen in Pharaoh's life. But part of that's also what's got to happen in the Israelites' life. They need the time to see this and to understand this. Let's imagine that one of the professors from Southeastern comes and volunteers to spend the day here and to to describe to me the introductory concepts of astrophysics. I've been curious about Einstein's theory of relativity and the bending of time and all of those things. So if that professor comes over and she spends eight hours with me explaining all of these things to me so that I can have a rudimentary beginning understanding and, 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 I, and I keep asking questions and she's got to back up. If it takes her eight hours just to do an introduction to that concept, does that eight hours reflect on the limitations of the professor or does that reflect on the imita- limitations on the student? That's me. (laughs) That's that's my problem. In fact, the only thing that that eight hours reveals about that instructor is that she is a kind and generous person to spend eight hours explaining to some knucklehead the introductions to astrophysics. Now, part of the problem, before anyone gets me a gift card to an eight-hour lecture on (laughs) astrophysics, I don't really know whether I care about Einstein's theory of relativity and the bending of time and light. I I, I don't understand any of those things. But you know, that's also part of the delay why the work of God takes so much time in our life. Because there are some things that God wants to do inside of our life and not only does it take us a period of time to keep up and to, to, to stay up with what he is trying to do, but there's a bunch of stuff that God wants to do inside of our life that at this point in time, we don't care about yet. And until we begin to care about some of the right things, it's going to take time before God can unfold those things in our life. One of the things that you just have to know, one of the things you just have to hear is that the work of God takes time. Boy, it wouldn't take much for us just to kind of jot down some things. These are the things that I wish God would hurry up and do. Hear me, hear me, hear me. The work of God takes time. Uh, Secondly, uh, what I want you to see here in the text is what I I want you to see here in the text is that the delays can be productive. That the delays can be productive. 20 years. Man, 20 years is a long time. I I don't know, you know, which, I don't know whether 20 years feels longer for you looking backwards or 20 years feels longer for you looking forward. That'd be an interesting uh, question. Which one feels more distant? But 20 years is a really, really long time. If I have to wait like 
10 to 14 days. I, I get itchy sometimes. I, I, want, I want things to move on. 20 years. But I want you to just kind of review with me some of the things that happens inside of this 20 years in David's life. Some of the things we read about, many of the things we kind of missed in some of the chapters uh, since the last place that we read together. But I want you to see that in this period of time that God gives David this incredible friendship with Jonathan, which is the friendship of a lifetime. I want you to see inside of this 20 years that David not only lives with Samuel for a little while, but he is mentored by Samuel, one of the great godly men of the Old Testament. David goes into his house. You don't think that made a difference in his life for the rest of his life. We also see that in this period of time that David grows as a commander of men and in military prowess. We find out that David in this time period learns how to inquire of God and say, God, what am I supposed to do next? Where am I supposed to go with my life? He learns how to pray and how to ask God for leadership and direction in his life. In this period of time, he learns how to write Psalms and he grows and he expands his soul and becomes a great worshiper of God. One of the things that happens over this period of time, this is complicated. One of the things that happens in this period of time is that David gets he gets older. <laughs> you know that when David first shows up to the scene, everyone says, how can you do such and such? You're just a kid. But did you notice at the end of verse 21 that when David is pretending to be crazy, he has the spittle run down his, his beard. Part of what happens is David gets old enough to grow a beard. People, are, people respect people with a beard, if you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> He, he, gets, he gets older. His reputation grows. What we see here in chapter 22 is that all of these wild people, the people who are in debt, the people who are angry, the people who are bitter, the people who have no place to go, they come and start to follow David. Man, you got to be a pretty good leader to be able to have that crowd as your followers. These are the people that say, we don't play by any rules. We don't want to follow anyone, but we're going to follow you. In this period of time, Saul's life and leadership and kingship begins to unravel further so that when David becomes king, the nation is ready to receive him and to follow him and say, you are our king. You see, God uses that delay. God uses all of that time frame. That time when you're looking at your watch and saying, come on, come on, come on, hurry up. We got to go. We got to go. In the middle of those things, God is using every one of those things to accomplish new things inside of our life. I want you to know that that's true in our lives as well. There are several verses in the New Testament that describe some of the way in which God uses time to grow us and to develop us. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion to the day of Christ. Listen, he is going to continue that work. Romans 5 says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and that endurance produces character and that character produces hope. He tells us in James, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. There is something that happens in the duration, in the delay, in the waiting that God says, that's the time that I'm doing and using. In fact, some of the most productive, some of the most important times are some of the most difficult times that we face. Those are the places where God is really unpacking, developing, and really doing that work in our life. I kind of wonder, when David was anointed, as some folks have tried to pinpoint that age in his life, probably sometime between 10 to 12 years old. Imagine if David was anointed as king someplace in those early, early years. And the moment that he was anointed king, that four guys with one of those little carriers that you put on your shoulders, four guys came in, swooped him up, put him on there, ran him into the capital and put a crown on him and said, David, you are king. If that had happened the day that he was anointed. 
I have a Hebrew word for that. It's called yikes. I think yikes for David. I think yikes for the people of God. There was no way on earth that he was ready in that moment until he had developed that friendship with Jonathan, till he had been mentored by Samuel, till he had grown as a military commander, till he had gotten older, till he had earned the respect of people and developed his leadership skills, till he had learned how to be a person of prayer, to be a person of worship, until the nation had become ready for all of those things. It takes time for God to unfold all of those things beyond just us. Now, sometimes I wrestle with, with the points here. And this was one of the ones that I wrestled with. It says, the delays can be productive. And what I wanted to say is, no, the delays are productive because God is at work and God does these things in our lives. And so I wanted to scratch that out and I wanted to say, the delays are productive because God is that present in our lives and he is working his agenda. But you'll notice that it still says the delays can be productive. Because God has also given us a spirit of free will. And he has given us a reaction. Let me tell you, the two people can walk the exact same journey. And in one of those places, they grow and grow in faith and in worship and in depth and in their character and every one of those ways. And another person walks the exact same journey and they grow disappointed and angry and bitter and lazy and they give up and all those kinds of things. God says, I will work in your circumstance. I will use your circumstance to grow you into what I want you to be. But there's still an element that depends on us to whether we receive his working inside of our life in those days. Oh, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. You're in the middle of those days right now. Will you allow him to be working in your life? Which leads us to the third thing that the the scripture reveals to us is that right now is more important than we think. Right now is more important than what we think. Here are two skills that most of us are really, really good at. Are you ready for these two skills? Okay, you can put them on your, on your resume when you're done you know, with church today. These two skills that almost all of us are really, really experts in. Impatience and nostalgia. We can't wait for what's coming. And boy, back then used to be so great. You know what that does? Is it jumps right over this moment. You know, of all of the time in history, there's only one that we actually can put our hands on. When it comes to our past, present, and our future, there's only one place that we can put our hands on and do something about and live in and be in the middle of and change. It's not our past and it's not our future. The only place that we can put our hands on and do something about is right now. And yet, Our tendency is that the point in time that we are least interested in is right now. We are impatient and we are nostalgic when the time that God has given to us is right now. I don't think that David understood it any better than we understand it sometimes. But I want you to know that these chapters that we're looking at, that we're summarizing this morning, these chapters, I think were some of the best days of David's life. Now, he may not have felt that as he was living in a cave, hiding for his life. He said, hey boys, this is the time of the life, isn't it? I don't know whether he said that. But I want you to know that in those days, he was living by faith. In those days, he was at his most creative. David wrote over half of the Psalms that we have in our Bible. More than half of his Psalms are written from this period of life. This was his most productive, creative 
season. This is the time that I think that he felt closest to God. This is the point in time that he felt the adventure of God. Not only that, but some of the days that were coming. When he arrives in Jerusalem, when he is king, some of those days that are coming are not as rosy as he thought they were going to be. Now, I did not have dinner with David in the last week of his life. But I think in his last week of his life, if you were to show him a snapshot of all of those years, and you were to say, David, what was the richest, best season of your life? Man, I was in this cave with 400 guys. And they would lay down their life for me. On a day-by-day basis, I said, God, what am I supposed to do today? And he would tell me. Those, man, those were the days. There was a man in a church that I used to pastor. His name was Roy. Roy, to this day, is one of the finest men that I've ever known and ever had the chance to pastor. Roy was godly, godly man. Roy was a generous man. Roy was, was a guy that would serve you in any way that he possibly could. But Roy also didn't like to waste anything. And he didn't like to waste money. And he didn't like to waste any generous gracious, all of those things. But boy, he, he didn't like to waste. And, and, and you know, sometimes you, you come to a, a tube of toothpaste and, and you want to roll that toothpaste up. I like to consider myself a person who can really squeeze the last ounce of the toothpaste out of the tube. It's kind of a competition for me to see how close I can get to squeezing everything out of that tube of toothpaste. We were talking once about Roy and his daughter said, you know what Roy does? He said, you know when you squeeze all of that toothpaste out? Oh well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do that too. He said, what Roy do, does is he takes, he takes his pocket knife out. And he slices that tube of toothpaste open because he knows that there's some stuff in there that he's already missed. And before he throws that away, he's going to cut that thing open, peel it open, and make sure that he has squeezed every bit of toothpaste out of that tube. Listen, I I want to squeeze everything out of this day that God has given to me. Because when this day is gone, I can't have my hands on it anymore. This day has been what God has given to me. And I'm telling you this, not because I get this right. Because it's what I want for my life and where I want to grow in my life. Is that God has given me these 24 hours. God has given me the opportunity to be with you all, to worship with you. God is going to give me, I think, a good lunch this afternoon. God is going to give us a great deacons meeting this afternoon. God is going to do all of those things. I'm going to take a nap someplace in there today. But all of those things that God has given to me in this day, the one that I can put my hands on, and I don't want to miss anything out of this day Because I'm being impatient about tomorrow or nostalgic about yesterday. This day. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13 puts it this way. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today. That none of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. But that passage says as long as you've got today. Make the most out of it. Plus today's a 25 hour day. I mean, really, today's the day you really got to squeeze every bit. Roy would love today. You get a free hour. They're going to take it back from you in the spring. But you got a free hour right now. Squeeze the most out of that day. Send her my heart covered as a gift and hope.
that you'll take it into her side.